church family, I thought that today I would begin today's service uh, here in my home. I finally got my Christmas tree up, and so I thought it would be a good place to sort of greet you. I know so many of you are in your homes. Uh, hopefully you have your Christmas decorations up, or you're about to. Uh, the Christmas tree, as many of you know, is a reminder of how Christ brings light back to the world. And so today, uh, as we jump into worship today, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ has made us a promise, a promise to bring light and goodness into the world. I've got a couple of announcements for you today. Um, while I go through those, if you haven't already, be sure to say hello in the comments section of the video. It's always very encouraging to your other worshipers to know that you are here with us. Uh, we are continuing this week on Wednesday night. We're going to be finishing up our very last Sunday uh, of our Bible study, Hidden Christmas. It's been lots of fun. Uh, and so if you'd like to join us on Wednesday night at 7 p.m., be sure to email me at adam at connectumc.org, and we will get you the information you need to jump in there with us. Also, uh, on Christmas Eve, the 24th, obviously, at 7 p.m., uh, we will be doing our online Christmas Eve worship. Uh, we have sent out to almost everybody uh, the small box of equipment that you need for the Advent season. In there is the candlelight, is the candles for the candlelight service on Christmas Eve. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to make sure you know where those are uh, as we prepare for Christmas Eve worship. If you'd like to participate in Christmas Eve and you don't have those candles, uh, be sure to contact us at the church office uh, and we will get those out to you. Other than that, uh, as we continue today, I want to invite you to join me in one of the great traditions that we have here at Connect Church, uh, and that is saying the things that unite us as a church family. Uh, we are united so much more than physical presence, uh, as each of us in our, are in our homes. Um, we are reminded that we are united by the things that we believe, the mission that we are on, uh, what we are trying to do, uh, and what God is doing in each of us. So if you'll join me in saying these things, you may want to uh, stand in your living room, uh, you may just want to sit in front of the the screen that you're watching, or you may want to just meditate on these in your hearts, uh, but I encourage you to kind of say them out loud. I know it can feel kind of silly, uh, but it's a neat way to uh, allow each of us uh, in our separate places uh, to be united together. So here we go. Here at Connect Church, our mission is to connect to God and connect to others. And our vision is to share the transforming power of Christ by creating a community set on making a difference in the world by living out Christ's three greats, the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, the commandment of great compassion. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And while these are the things that unite us here at Connect Church, we are also united with Christians around the world, and so each week we join their voices in saying the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, uh, as we jump into worship today, I hope that you are enabling yourself to be filled with joy. Uh, and I want to pray now for the world, uh, for all those who are suffering. Uh, and for the excitement that comes with the holiday season. So let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so very much for being who you are. We ask now that you would come into this world. Uh, we ask that you would help all of those who are suffering from the pandemic, that you would be a God of might and power, that you would help those who are in need, that you would work a miracle so that each and every person who is sick may be healed. God, we ask for your help. Please free us from the suffering of the pandemic. And today, as we move forward, allow us for just a moment to set aside distractions, to be grateful for you, and to have joy in you. In your holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen.
Now we've reached the point in our worship service where it is time to light our Advent candles. If you're in your home like I am, you can grab your Advent wreath that we've sent out to you. Uh, we've already lit the first two candles of Advent, the last two Sundays, both hope and love. Uh, so hopefully those are already lit. Uh, but I've asked the Haynes family to come and lead us in lighting the third candle, the pink candle, uh, and that is the candle of joy. So if you can take a moment now uh, and join them in lighting your candle of joy, uh, will allow God's presence and God's love and God's joy to come into your home. Merry Christmas from the Haynes family. We're proud to light this week's Advent candle. We want everything to look nice, the decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsels, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's the tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light this candle of a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season, not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things. The beauty of the heart and the soul. The beauty of the love, shared service, and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because of the birth of Jesus.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so joyful uh, to be here with you today because today is the Sunday of joy as we talk about Advent. Uh, Each of our uh, days as we are doing our sermon series called The Promise Kept, we talk about one of the promises that Jesus makes to us that we remember every year as we prepare for the Christmas season. There's a thing called Advent, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, An Advent is kind of the the traditional way that the church uh, leads up to Christmas and that we remember and celebrate the different things that Jesus has and is doing for us. And this year, we are talking about the promises, the promises that Jesus delivers on Christmas. Uh, Jesus promises that we will receive joy, hope, peace, and love. And so each Sunday, we are talking about those things. And today, we are talking about joy. So I am joyful that you are here with us. If you haven't already, I encourage you to uh, say hello in the comment section of this video. If you're a first-time guest, I really uh, ask you to go ahead and say hello so that we know that you are here. We can send you whatever information that you may need about the church uh, and answer any questions that you may have. So if you would like to uh, go ahead and do that now, uh, it's a real blessing to the rest of your worshipers to know that you are here with us. Uh, As I said, today we're going to continue our sermon series called The Promise Kept as we talk about Christmas and the story of Christmas. And we today particularly talk about the promise of joy. So we're going to start uh, today uh, with by reading a part of the uh, sort of the beginning of the Christmas story. This is where uh, Jesus is in uh, the womb of his Mary, of his mother Mary, uh, and Mary is going to visit Elizabeth, uh, who is pregnant with uh, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist has been appointed by God to be the one who sort of prepares the way for Jesus. And so John the Baptist, uh, apparently in the womb, has the ability uh, to recognize when Jesus comes close. And so we get this fun little story uh, that will help us understand about the joy of Christmas. So here we go. This is from Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, "'Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear.'" But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Even before the birth of Jesus, Jesus was bringing joy into the world. This is one of the promises of God. As uh, Jesus came close to John, even though they were both in the womb, John leaps for joy because he has this sense of what Jesus is bringing To the world. And and it's a sense that so many of us have lost uh, today. We oftentimes don't celebrate the the arrival of Jesus, the things that Jesus does, the incredible work of God in the way that we would like to. And so today is one of those times where we're going to take a little bit and remember the joy of the Lord. And so today uh, I want to talk about uh, a few things, but before we do that, I want you to just understand how important joy is. You see, joy is both a gift and a requirement to live a Christian life. We know that there are certain things that Christians have to do in order to be living consistently with the way that God wants them to live. Um, Love, for example, is, is is a vital characteristic for each Christian to have. If a person Uh, is a Christian, they should be able to 
be receiving love from God and sharing love with the world. If you knew a person who said they were a Christian, but they were not uh, receiving love from God, like, oh, God doesn't love me, and they weren't sharing God's love with the world, we would not say that that person was living consistently with the way that God wants them to. They are missing out on an essential thing that they are expected to do by God in order to meet uh, the requirements of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. They're not loving, and you have to be loving in order to be a disciple. But sometimes when it comes to joy, we, we seem to think that's like an optional bonus or something, that, that, that you can be a joyful person as a Christian, but you don't have to be. It's not like it's an essential thing. But what I'm here to tell you is that, yeah, it is. Hope, love, joy, and peace are all essential things of, of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If a person is a disciple of Jesus Christ and living consistently with the way that God wants them to live, then they are living with joy. Now, I don't want to stress you out because, because that's not particularly helpful. If I tell you uh, in order to be a Christian, you have to live with joy, I've, I've had this conversation before where somebody says, well, I, I'm not particularly happy and joyful. I struggle with depression and, and all sorts of different things. And so does that mean uh, not only am I, am I not Christianing right and not joyful, now I also have to feel guilty about the fact that I don't have joy. And that's not what I want. What, all I'm saying is, is that because joy is an essential part of what it is to be a disciple, it, it means that it's not something that we should just shrug off. That, that we should be very intentional about being a joyful people. That we should be happy. Um, that we should experience God's happiness and God's joy in our life. And if we're not there yet, then it's not something that we just say, eh, it's actually something that we should try very intentionally to do because it's an essential part of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Some people find it very easy to live a joyful life and celebrate the things that God has done in their life. Other people struggle with that, and that's okay, but it's important that each and every one of us are intentional and recognize that, that experiencing, living, sharing joy is an essential part of, of what it is to be a Christian. Now, it's also a great thing, right? It's a gift, Having love, having joy, having hope, having peace, these are all gifts, but they're also essential characteristics of disciples of Jesus Christ. And so, what I want to do today uh, is I want to, I want to talk about three things um, that make the reasons why joy is so important. There's many more. I, I could talk about joy for months, but we're going to, just for the sake of, of getting through today uh, while we're still young, uh, I want to talk about three uh, things that, that, that God gives to, the three reasons why it's so important uh, to experience joy and, and what the promise of joy does for us. And then after that, I want to talk about two things uh, that we can do to actually experience that joy. So, so let's start with this. These are, the, these are the three reasons why, some of the other reasons, but these are three of the reasons that we're going to talk about today about why it's so important to be a people of joy. The first one is that God prom God's promise of joy allows us to to live more hopeful lives. It is not optional to be a joyful person because joy is so linked to hope, and hope is so linked to joy. We have to be, as Christians, people of hope. Hope in what God is doing in the world. Hope in, in what is in the future. Hope that, that, that things will be better than they are today. And, and many of the things that we talk about, especially these four promises that we're talking about in Advent, today we talk about the promise of joy, joy is, is very much linked to the promise of hope. It is very hard to be a hopeful person without being a joyful person, and it's very hard to be a joyful person without being a hopeful person. And so one of the reasons why the promise of joy is so important is because it is so linked to the promise of hope. This is Romans 15, 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Uh, at my house, I have a calendar, and me and the kiddos sometimes uh, we'll get out this calendar and we will use this uh, in a way to sort of organize our week and, and think about the things that we have coming up. And I wanted to show you that calendar really quickly because I think it'll help you and me understand a little bit about uh, the tie between joy and hope. Hello everybody. I wanted to bring you back to my living room and show you uh, my calendar. This is the, I have an electronic calendar like most of you, but this is the 
the one that we have at the house where we write down uh, the different things that are coming up. And it's always fun when we get to write down things in the future that we're looking forward to. Uh, one of the great joys is, of life is getting to look forward to good things. And this is the 2020 calendar. We haven't got the 2021 calendar yet. But my expectation is that the 2021 calendar will have good and incredible things that happen. And, and my expectation is, is of joy, not because I haven't experienced hardship or difficulty. We certainly all have. But I do know and have confidence in the fact that God is at work. And because God is at work, I have hope and joy in the future. And so anytime we think about the future, like we do when we write down things on the calendar, it's important that we do that with a joyful attitude because we know that the future that is happening is a future in which God is at work and God is bringing about good things. So the whole reason I wanted to bring you and show you the calendar is just to get you thinking about how often you and I think about the future. And it's important that we think about the future in a way that is joyful, not for any other reason other than the fact that we know that God has the future under control and that God is at work bringing about good, joyful, and happy things. And so I encourage you, as you think about the future, to smile, not to dread it, to be full of joy, not fear, because God is at work. It's important to me that you believe me when I say that, that the future is going to be better than today. That God is, is, is at work constantly bringing about a good future. That God is doing new and good things all the time to bring about a better future for you and for me. That in the end of the story, God wins and that we get to experience joy and hope and peace in a way that abounds and transforms. We're going to have the best end of the story that we've ever, that's ever been written. In our future is the best days yet to come. The things that God is at work doing, the things that God is bringing about are better than anything that any of us have ever experienced. The future is better than the present. And it's important to me and it's important to God that you believe that. Now, I'm not unrealistic. I know uh, that, that life is not linear, right? Tomorrow doesn't get a little bit better, the next day a little bit better, the next day a little bit better until we die. That's not how it works. There's ups and downs in life. There's good times and bad times. There's difficult seasons. There's pain in our future. But at the end, at the end of the story, the place that God is getting us to is better than anything we've ever experienced before. And when we recognize that and we believe that, we can not only have hope in the future, but we can also have joy in the present because what is coming is better than what's been. What is coming is better than what's now. And so the gift of joy, the reason why it's so important is because joy enables hope and hope enables joy. These two things are tied together. It's important to me that you know, especially if you're in a hard spot right now, like so many of us are, the future is going to be better. <laughs> that God is going to bring good and new things. Our best days are yet to come. And that's one of the reasons why joy is so important, because it enables a hope in the future. The other promise that I wanted to talk about, and the reason why joy is so important, is that God's promise of joy enables us to live with great strength. Oftentimes we talk about courage. And how courage is a source of great strength. If you're a courageous person, then you are not conquered by fear. If something scary happens, it doesn't matter. You're courageous, and so you overcome it, and you do the things that you need to do to get through life. And so a courageous person is a strong person. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of true. Uh, but we often neglect how much of a source of strength joy is. And, and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm trying to make a pitch to you today about the importance of joy is because joy is such an essential element to allowing us to get through life. Joy is a source of strength that will allow us to overcome so many of the difficult things that we may face in life. James 1-2 says, count it all as joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What James is talking about is how joy can provide a layer of protection to our hearts and lives as we go through life and face difficult things. James says, count it all as joy because 
the Bible, James, God, nobody promises that we will not face difficult and, and hard things in life. As I said a little bit ago, life is up and down. And so uh, our, our best days are definitely in our future, uh, but our worst days might be. Uh, hopefully not, but they could be. Um, bad things can and often do happen in life. And what joy does is it enables us to sort of endure that and overcome those things. It, it gives us a layer of strength. So when I was a kid, I would watch um, a show called Star Trek. Um, some of you may have seen it. I know it's kind of dorky. Don't make fun of me. But Star Trek, uh, on Star Trek, they had a spaceship, and the spaceship was called uh, the Starship Enterprise right here. This is the Starship Enterprise. And so the Starship Enterprise um, would fly around the, the galaxy, and they would sometimes come into contact with other aliens. And when it came into contact with other aliens, sometimes they would get in fights. And if they got in fights, the other aliens would shoot phasers or photon torpedoes or whatever at the Starship Enterprise. And when they shot him at the Starship Enterprise, the captain would say, shields up. And when he said shields up, there was an invisible barrier created around the spaceship that prevented it from being destroyed. Now, every time the phasers or the torpedoes would hit that shield, the ship would shake and, and sometimes it would get damaged, but it would never be completely destroyed. And that's, that's kind of what joy does for us. It kind of puts an, an invisible shield around us as we walk through life. And as those bad things happen in our lives, we can't always control or prevent those things. And they will hit us and they will cause us some heartbreak and, and some um, hard times and some challenges when we get hit with the dark parts of life, it's going to affect us and impact us. But, but joy enables us to not be completely destroyed. It sort of creates this shield that enables us to go through life because we are grateful for, for God, for the things that God has done. We know about the future and, and the, the things that God is doing in the future. We know about the past and, and the grace that Jesus Christ has bought, brought to us and freed us from sin and death. And, and because we are covered by this this, this protective shield, it enables you and me to continue to walk through life and do the things that are necessary to be functioning good disciples of Jesus Christ who are bringing goodness to the world. We can always be faithful. You see, joy is a source of strength. It enables us to get through the hard times. And that's one of the reasons why joy is so important. It's one of the reasons why it's essential. It's one of the reasons why we can't just shrug it off and say, well, I'm not joyful but that's okay. We have to choose to pursue the gift of joy, to receive the promise of joy from God, and to become a joyful people. Nehemiah uh, describes it even better in 8.10. He says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing already, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We are given strength by joy, and you will be a stronger, more functioning, happier person, able to endure hardship more adequately if you decide to embrace the promise of joy that God has given to you. So, joy enables us to have a, a source of strength, and this is why it's so important, but that's not the only thing that it does. We're going to talk about the third important reason why uh, we need to have joy, and that is that God's promise of joy allows us to love others more fully. Second John 1.12 says, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk to you face to face so that our joy may be complete. In this scripture, John is writing to some of his friends, and he describes a spiritual truth about joy that's really helpful for you and me. And, and what he's saying is, is, that, is that it is through joy that we are able to fully unite and love one another, that it's, that it's an essential element. Joy is an essential element that enables us to unite and love each other. This is why joy is so important. One of the most uh, maybe frustrating things in relationships is when one person goes to another person that they care for and, and, and something good has happened in my life and I go and I say, hey, this incredible, wonderful, awesome thing happened. Isn't this exciting? And, and the person that you tell doesn't share your joy and excitement. That can be very frustrating. I think most of uh, folks who have been married uh, at, at one point or another have, have gone to their spouse to share some exciting news or, or to share some joy, and that spouse, ha spouse has not reacted in the way that he or she would like. And that can be kind of a, a difficult thing. 
And joy is a tool that is used really effectively to enable us to love one another. That, that not only are we called by God, for those that are closest with us, to, to allow our hearts to break when their hearts are breaking, to have empathy for one another in difficult times, God also calls us to celebrate and have joy for one another. One another. Because it is through sharing that joy and those moments of joy that we can really love and care for each other in the way that God calls us to. And so it's important for you and for me to make the choice to say, you know what, if they're celebrating, I'm celebrating. And, and it's an important spiritual discipline to intentionally decide to genuinely be happy for the people that you love. And to say to them, you have this victory, let's be happy about it together. You've had this good thing, let's be excited about it together. This is a, a great and a special gift that we can give to people and that really solidifies our relationships and, and allows us to love each other more fully. And so I encourage you, uh, if you haven't already and if you haven't ever thought about this, um, to be very intentional about celebrating with people in your life um, when good things happen to them and, and genuinely being happy for those other people because it can be a really effective way to love them. So those are the three uh, ways in which uh, and why uh, joy is so important in our lives. And so I wanted to talk now for just a, a few more minutes about the two things that we can do to fully embrace the promise of joy. Because I'm, I'm hope, hoping that I have convinced you now how important joy is. That, that joy can do some incredible stuff in our lives. Um, and, and it's hard just to snap our fingers and become more joyful. So I want to share with you two strategies uh, that I hope uh, will enable you to embrace this gift and this promise of joy that God has given to you and, and be a part of bringing light to the world uh, via joy. So the first strategy is that we can embrace the promise of joy when we choose to see God's work. So often we keep our eyes closed to the incredible work that God is doing in the world. The Christmas story has a great example of this and so uh, uh, Mary and Joseph have gone to Bethlehem. They've had the child and outside of town, there are some shepherds, and these shepherds get an amazing opportunity to be a part of the Christmas story, to see the arrival of the Messiah. And so I want to read that story to you really quickly. It's from Luke 2, beginning in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So the shepherds are, are not particularly important people in society. They're, they're, they're not talked about in any other place in the Bible. They're just hanging out, watching their sheep, and suddenly angels appear <laughs> in the sky. And of course, naturally, the shepherds are afraid, and, and they are able to sort of calm down and the angels say to them, you shouldn't be fearing, feeling fear, you should be experiencing joy because Jesus is here. And Jesus has come to bring goodness and hope and grace and to free us from the power of sin and death. Jesus is here. Isn't this wonderful? Now the shepherds choose to accept this, to put aside their fear and embrace the joy, to embrace the things that God is doing in the world. And, and kudos to them. Because they have the spiritual discipline to open their eyes, look beyond their fear, and see that God is doing something incredible and take joy in that. You and I today aren't as good at this as the shepherds seem to be. We sometimes choose to close our eyes to some of the incredible things that God is doing in the world and instead focus on our fears, our anger, our sin, our hatred, the things that are not going well. I can't tell you how many times I have gone through my day and 99% of the day is good. Good things happen. People uh, that I love, love me back. I'm able to get things done. I'm able to feed myself and my family. I have a place to sleep. I have everything that I need to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. But that day, somebody said something to me that just makes me angry. Or somebody cut me off on traffic. Or something frustrating happened. Or something bad happened. And I spend all of my evening focusing on the one bad thing that happened when 99% of the day was good and a blessing. And I close my 
eyes to the great things that are happening in my life and focus in on the things that I perceive to be negative or bad. I am choosing to not embrace the promise of joy and instead focus on these other things. And it has a negative impact on my soul and on the hearts and souls of the people around me. And so what you and I have to do is open our eyes and look around and see how many good things God is doing. God has done incredible things in the past. The birth of Jesus Christ and the freedom that we now have from sin and death is amazing and something that we should embrace. God is going to do incredible things in the future. He promises that the future will be better than things are today. And so you and I get to choose and now and, and here to open our eyes and see these things. One of the, the best spiritual practices that I know of uh, that I've been talking a lot about lately because I want everybody to try it is called gratitude journaling. You take a journal. It doesn't even have to be. It can be a notebook. It can be a bunch of post-it notes. I don't care. You take some paper and every day you write down the things that you are grateful for and you spend time thanking God for those things. And by doing that thing, and allowing yourself to have joy in the blessings and, and looking around intentionally and seeing the things that God is doing, it will have a massive and positive impact on your spiritual health and on the lives of the people around you. We have to open our eyes and see the incredible things that God is doing instead of closing our eyes to those things and only looking at the problems, the negative, the hardship, and the difficulty. If we are going to be people of joy and embrace God's promise of joy and enable ourselves to do all the things that I've already talked about today, then we have to choose to see the things that God is doing. So that's uh, my first strategy for embracing joy. The second one is that we can embrace the promise of joy when we spend time celebrating what God has done. Psalm 118.24 says, This is the day of the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to encourage you today to smile about it. It is okay and good and right to celebrate. I love our Christian holidays. I love Christmas. I love Easter because those are two of the, the, the holidays that we get to do the most celebrating. And I think that's important to our spiritual health. So often, at least I am, and, and I know there's others of you that are like me, I have a tendency to just move on to the next thing. Uh, all right, we finished this. Now what do we need to work on next? And, and I'm not very good at stopping and celebrating what has happened. And, and I think that's a tragedy for my spiritual health and, and maybe for some of you that I, that I don't do a good job of saying, this is awesome. <laughs> what God has done is, is fantastic. What God has allowed us to accomplish is great. What is going on is good. We, we don't do a good job of celebrating and embracing the incredible things that God is doing. And I want to give you permission as a, as a uh, Christian, as a fellow disciple of Jesus Christ, I want to give you permission to be happy about it, to celebrate. I want Have a blowout on Christmas. Laugh and have fun and enjoy the people who are around you. And, and if you can be together in person, great. If you're doing it electronically and via Zoom and all that, then that's fine too. But but take a moment and celebrate the incredible things that God is doing. Smile about it. Be grateful for it. This is good. Now, one of the things that, that we do as, as Christians is that we seem to have trouble having joy and we turn celebrations of joy into problems. On Christmas, uh, there's a pattern where we spend too much money and do too much and so the joy of Christmas is replaced by the stress of Christmas, and we spend January and February paying off credit cards. And that's not a joyful celebration. We should do less of that so that we can have more joy. Just, just spend less. That's okay. We, we obligate ourselves to be here and there and do this thing and that time. And, and I hear so oftentimes the terms, the holiday stress. And, and it shouldn't be that. These are supposed to be celebrations where we are celebrating the things that God has given to us. So, so my two tips um, to embracing the promise of joy is to one, it's not complicated, open our eyes and see the great things that God is doing and celebrate them. That's it. Notice and celebrate. 
intentionally notice the incredible things that God is doing and then intentionally celebrate the incredible things that God is doing. Take time and smile and celebrate and be joyful. Talk about it with your family. Isn't it awesome the things that God has done? Jesus Christ has, has, has saved us from sin and death. Jesus has given us the ability to love one another and be here together. Yes, there's some bad things that have happened, but today on Christmas Day, when it gets to be Christmas, take some time and be happy. Talk about the good things. Don't talk about the work that needs to be done. Don't talk about the credit card bills that have to be paid off because you don't have to do that. Be happy. I want you this year to choose to see the good things that God is doing and celebrate the good things that God is doing. And by doing that, you and I can finally embrace the promise of joy that Jesus gives to us on Christmas. And so I, today, I, I just want to encourage you to smile about it. To smile about the things that God is doing. God's at work. And, and the best part about it is, maybe the best part, is that the future is going to be better than today. So, so let's take some time and let's smile about what God is doing in the world. And, and let's, let's make Christmas a celebration. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now that we have received uh, the Word of God, I hope it was meaningful to you as it has been for me, I would like to encourage you to respond. In this moment, I encourage you to respond through our giving. Uh, I've been blown away uh, throughout 2020 with how many of you have continued to be so faithful, uh, enabling the church to continue our ministries, uh, the, the people that we help in the, in the various foster ministries, uh, the things that we do, uh, all over our community, as well as just simply bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to you each week. So I just want to say a big thank you uh, to all of you who have been so incredibly faithful to your pledges, your offerings, your tithes. Um, I would encourage you now, if you haven't already, to click in the link of the description of this video. Uh, be faithful to God's call to generosity uh, and be joyful um, as God gives you an opportunity uh, to serve and to participate in this way. So. Uh, give now, uh, be blessed as you bless others. They did not find a palace, just a humble village home, and searching for a king, but finding a child, no crown, no throne. Still they bow. Instead they gazed in the awe
Whenever we do Holy Communion at church, we oftentimes take a big fancy loaf and we break it and we have fancy uh, cups where we take the grape juice. But, but a long time ago, when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, I don't think they had fancy uh, loaves of bread or, or fancy uh, cups or anything like that. It was a very ordinary meal. And as they gathered, uh, Jesus took very ordinary bread, like this bread that's here at my home, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do it, remember me. And so for nearly 2,000 years, Christians around the world have gathered together to experience God's grace in this way, knowing that God is present. And when Jesus did this, he picked bread and wine because it was some of the most common stuff that was available to each person uh, in the community at the time. And so today, I encourage you, if you haven't already, to grab your small single-serving communion cup uh, that we've sent out to you, or you can simply grab bread and grape juice in your home, and in these moments, receive Holy Communion, knowing that God is present and God is with you. Let us pray. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, and in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, now and forever, Almighty Father. Amen. I hope now that you are receiving a Holy Communion. Uh, the mystery of faith, the way in which we know uh, that God is at work in, in beyond what we can often comprehend. And so, from my home to your home, from my family to your family, I hope that God has brought joy to you today. Uh, may you be blessed, and may you go from this place in peace, knowing that God wants to give you the gift of joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.